The first guest of the evening is truly a poet. He's an artist. He is a, a friend and an inspiration to anyone who I think who has ever played the guitar uh, or tried to write poetry. Would you please welcome Gordon Lightfoot? His father was a man who could never understand the shame on a red man's face. So they lived in the hills and they never came down but to trade in the white man's place. It was early in the spring when the snow had disappeared, they came down with a bag of skins. In the fall of the year of 1910, Daddy died by the rope down in Cherokee Bend. This is Carefree Highway Revisited, the show that celebrates Gordon Lightfoot's music song by song, a proud member of the That's Not Canon podcast network. I'm your host, Mike Messner, and with me today is a fellow Lightfoot fan making his second appearance on the show, Quentin Paul Kuntz. Q, welcome back to the show. Hey, great to be here, my friend. All right. The last time you were on here, I think we were talking about The Watchman's Gone, and people have certainly been listening to that episode. And today we're going to be talking about Cherokee Bend. And I wanted to know why you wanted to talk about this one in particular today. Mainly because I asked Gordon about this song. And he told me that he took great pride in knowing Native American or in Canada, as you know, it's called First Nation history. And I've been with him twice at Native American casinos where the elders presented him with uh, special feathers and tributes made of leather. And the elders specifically mentioned this song. So that's the hook for me. Fantastic. So they heard it and they took it in the spirit it was intended, and they probably saw it as a very brave tribute. And certainly it's set in the United States, but the same story happened on both sides of the border to the First Nations and the Native Americans. And sadly, even this song, as profound and stark as it is, only scratches the surface of the kind of things that happened. Which That's is, truth. By the United States' own census, in 1800, there were 5.5 million Native Americans. A lot of people feel that's low because we hadn't been out west of the Mississippi at that time. In 1900, there were less than 400,000 in America. That's just despicable. It, it is. And, you know, they say the twin pillars of our shame, of course, is slavery. And we really did have a holocaust of Native Americans. We took their land. It's an incredibly sad story. And as you know, Gordon doesn't really get political. When you look at research, this is one of his most haunting songs. Of course, the Edmund Fitzgerald ranks as number one, maybe Black Day in July. But this song gets me every time. Well, it's a little bit less specific than Edmund Fitzgerald or Black Day in July. I mean, you True. see these events being replicated in some form or fashion all over the place in both Canada and the States. And they were comparably treated and badly treated by white explorers, the white church, some people who were well-intended, some who were just out for greed. And the reason that I like it is all of those reasons, plus the fact that it's a great story song. Mm -hmm. And Gordon has written some really good story songs, of course. You mentioned a couple. There are others, but this one is as good a story song, I think, as he has ever done and arguably as good as Dylan ever did because it's so meaningful to so many different people. Do you have any anecdotal stories about the song and what it's meant to you personally, Quentin? Yes. I know you know about the background of the song, but there's so much in here. History, the Cherokee Nation was the largest group of Native Americans. Today, there's about 900,000 Native Americans in America and 140,000 are Cherokees. It's oh. by far the largest, what we call sovereign nation in the United States of Native peoples. They covered eight states at their height. And of course, you can't say the word Cherokee without mentioning the Trail of Tears. Yes. Which was the 1838 Removal Act, incredibly cruel. They marched 4,000 Native Americans to their death. Yeah, and it was done in contempt of a Supreme Court order that That's said, correct. President Jackson, you can't do that. And yep. Jackson 
very ballsily said, okay, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let's see him enforce it. And yeah. it proved that there are limits to the Republic because the court really could not do anything. I suppose they could have impeached Jackson for having contempt of the Supreme Court. But the fact was that they didn't have any control of the military and they couldn't stop him from doing it. And Correct. so in addition to the fact that it was lethal, it was genocide to the mm -hmm. people who were involved with it, it also showed the limits to the system that we tried setting up in 1776 and we still haven't perfected it yet. And a very sad note, is that historians have pointed out that the Japanese studied the Trail of Tears and they used it, it was called the Battle of Bataan. I think it was called the Death March in Bataan in the Philippines. It was mainly Filipinos that died, but some Americans died too. And that just gives you a glimpse, like you said, scratching the surface, how unbelievably cruel and heartless our policies were for decades about Native Americans. And again, Gordon said one more thing when he was talking about it. And again, as I said before, we all know you didn't hear a lot of political stuff from him. But I think this song really shows his humanity. Deeply so. And the fact that he has compassion and he's not just giving lip service to something that was a tragic event. He was talking about it in a meaningful way, but he was also not trying to cash in on it. And I think right. that's so honorable that he did that. What's the best setting for you to listen to the song in? For me, it's a big road song. And I also love, as I mentioned in my previous interview with you, I love going to dunes up in Michigan. Whenever I'm in nature, I probably wouldn't listen to the song in the city. I live in Cleveland, Ohio, but in nature or a road song for me. I think a lot of people have that attitude about Gord's music. Uh, matter of fact, yeah. I think that's if there were a majority that I've kept track of, it would be that people listen to it in their cars or when they're going from one place to another. For me, this is a campfire song. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to be with my guitar because it's a fairly simple chord progression. Um, I would love to be with my guitar at a campfire singing this to people who could really understand it and who would really appreciate it. So I'll bring the s'mores, Michael. <laughs> yeah, well, just for me, I don't eat marshmallows, but you can just bring me a chocolate bar and I'm a happy guy. Uh, I'm with there too, because s'mores are not good for men with beards. <laughs> ah, yeah. Well, and that counts for both of us. So maybe exactly. just chocolate and call it good. Let's talk a little bit about the background of the song. And we both know it. For those of our listeners that don't, it's based on the book, When the Legends Die by Hal Borland. Lightfoot apparently read an adaptation of the book in a issue of Reader's Digest magazine and wrote the song. The Borland book is used a lot in schools or was used a lot in schools. And I think it's still used a lot by homeschool families to talk about tragic events with Native Americans and with whites. But you may be able to enlighten me on this cue. And that is that I think it was also made into a movie, was it not? Yes, it was. It's not a bad movie. And by the way, I don't like advertising for Jeff Bezos, but it is on Amazon Prime. Richard Widmark is in it, who was a famous actor in his day. They used a number of Native American actors in the movie. It's pretty good. If you listen to the song lyrics or read the lyrics and know this movie, you, you could see how it inspired Gordon. The plot, well, uh, I should say the song has a number of items from the plot. I highly recommend it. Also, I want to throw in real quick, before I forget, another movie that's really good close to this time is called Buffalo Bill and the Indians, 1976 movie. Paul Newman wanted to make this movie, and he had Burt Lancaster and a couple other people in it. And it does show another tragic event in American history, the so-called Native American shows. I just want to throw that in because that is an excellent movie. Directed by Robert Altman, by the way, of Nashville fame. Oh, goodness. OK, well, that is definitely going to be an interesting view then, because Altman, the character of his movies, that he's just absolutely all over the place. But that would be an interesting thing to watch one night when you're in the mood for an unusual. <laughs> yeah, cinematic. it is quite unusual, but it's really good. Now, there is no real place named Cherokee Bend that matches this description, but this is still a very accurate song. 
am I right in thinking that there's actually not a place called Cherokee Bend that looks There is like a this? subdivision in Alabama called Cherokee Bend, but it's only about 30 years old. So you're okay. right. Okay. So for our purposes, there's nothing, there it's is mythical. no Cherokee Bend that inspired this right. by name. Okay. Got it. Well, let's get into the lyrics and there's a lot to talk about here. His father was a man who could never understand the shame on a red man's face. And I think that this is somebody who's not ashamed of being an indigenous person who chooses not to pay attention to the caste system that the whites have set up, never learn to be ashamed, which was the trip that was being laid on the Native Americans by whites, that they were second class human beings. So they lived in the hills and they never came down but to trade in the white man's place. And so this man's father knows that he's expected to stay in his place, stay in his pigeonhole, be a quote unquote good Indian. And mm -hmm. he, this man, wants nothing to do with that attitude. I think exactly right. I think the opening stanzas sets the tone for the amount of hate and the severe poverty when he's talking about the government story, you're talking about what were so-called Indian agents who were notoriously crooked, cruel, stole a lot of the money, did not give out proper allotments. And they talk about these Native Americans were in rags, basically, and they were totally dependent on these so-called government stories and Indian agents who were representing the government. It sets the tone, I think, right out of the box. Yeah. And it almost could be a short story at this point just the way that it's introduced. And the Indian agents, so-called, were absolutely corrupt and they more egregiously so during the Grant administration. This is set in 1910, right. uh, by which time Grant, of course, was gone. But the corruption is almost endemic even after the displacement of Native Americans. Okay, the abuse went on because these were people who didn't care about Native Americans. They just wanted a government job. They might have had this gig only because of political patronage. That's often it was often the case. They were a brother-in-law or cousin to somebody in power. Or they had given money to a campaign. And so the, sure. the, the president had a way of returning favors. And that was it. Kind of like almost ambassadors. And we all know sometimes ambassadorships are given to pals of politicians. Oh, yeah. You know, usually wealthy pals. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Not you <right>. and I. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was early in the spring when the snow had disappeared. They came down with a bag of skins. Now, we don't know what the skins are. I'm guessing that they were deer because those were almost used as currency in some parts of Kentucky and other states. In the fall of the year of 1910, Daddy died by the rope down in Cherokee Bend. And of course, we're talking about probably an illegal lynching rather than somebody that has gone through a due process of law. We're not really privy to that, but I think we can probably infer that. I agree. And remember, as I said earlier, by the time we get to 1910, these were some of the worst years in the entire history for Native Americans. Late 1800s, early 1900s, very, very bad. You know, Native Americans in their writings will say, particularly after 1880, will say, most of them knew more people who were dead than alive. Yeah. And you mentioned that, let's stop back and give just a little bit more historical context with this. You have what's called the Dawes Severalty Act in 1887. Yeah. And what that did was essentially try to get rid of tribal groups and turn them into nuclear families, meaning that the land that had been set aside for them was now going to be set aside for biological families rather than tribal groups. And of course, the Native Americans had no say in this. So not only had their land been taken away, but now they were trying to take away their very identity of being part of something bigger than just their immediate blood relatives. They are now the tribes are being persecuted institutionally. And so I can understand why this would be seen as being some of the darkest times from the 1880s through the 1910s. You're making a huge point here because they took the youth, they cut their hair, they didn't allow them to speak their native language or practice their own religion. And what I find the ultimate irony is find a Native American or what they call Indian head nickel. And what's stamped on every nickel? 
with a Native American buffalo on one side, probably Red Cloud or Sitting Bull on the other side, the word liberty. Yeah, there's some real bitter irony there. Makes me very angry. And it should. And we will get into the Native American schools a little later. We'll be right back to our conversation with Quentin Paul Kuntz about Cherokee Bend. But first, a word from a podcast partner or two. In 1942, when the world needed a hero to fight the forces of evil, a woman had the courage to step forward. Her name was Helen Meeker. Her adventures took her across the United States and behind the lines of both the European and Pacific fronts. President Franklin Roosevelt trusted her judgment. Adolf Hitler put a price on her head. And in the face of overwhelming odds, She battled through everything that was thrown at her, dodged death countless times, and challenged the most diabolical figures in history. The star of more than 20 novels, Helen Meeker proved her grit and determination time and time again. And now the Long Highway players bring the book series to life on the airways. These exciting dramas will place you in the middle of the action, immerse you in riveting drama, plunge you into unimagined intrigue and confound you with dark mysteries while giving you the opportunity to live adventures in a time when the fate of the world hung in the balance. Enjoy the exploits of Helen Meeker and follow author Ace Collins's In the President Service series on That's Not Canon Podcast Network. Hi, this is Audie Martello, the host of the Mostly Folk Podcast, a 60-minute foray into the music we all love. You will hear newly released albums, classic folk, country, and bluegrass music, as well as some traditional music that may or may not be true to the genre. Sometimes irreverent, often opinionated, but always entertaining. You may even hear a radio magic trick every so often as well as numerous interviews via Zoom and telephone with established as well as indie artists. Mostly Folk is available wherever you listen to podcasts and always at mostlyfolk.org. Daddy didn't like what the white man said about the dirty little kid at his side. Now, we don't know exactly what the white man said, but it was obviously degrading and may have been racist or it may have been just what's this scrawny kid doing? Again, we don't know. Daddy didn't like what the white man did, nor the deal or the way that he lied. So this traitor or this agent or whomever it is, is corrupt, probably cheating his customers and being deceitful about the value about whatever it is he is selling or giving in exchange. And that could be any number of things. It could be blankets that have smallpox. It could be rotten food. It could be shoes with holes in them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's corruption here all the way around. There was blood on the floor of the government store when the men took his daddy away. Now, there's been some sort of a struggle where blood was shed. We don't know who started the fight. We don't know what it was fought with. We don't know if there were guns, knives, fists. We don't even know whose blood it is. We just know that it was this boy's father, the Native American, who was blamed And that would have happened under any circumstances. If it had been five to one, five whites against one native, and they beat the piss out of this poor man, the Native American would still have been blamed for it. Absolutely. But the boy stayed back till he come to his end and he run like the wind from Cherokee Bend. And so I'm thinking he's hiding from the authorities. He's probably witnessed the whole thing. And then he sees his chance and he gets out of there and escapes back to the lodge where his family lives up in the hills. I also wanted to jump in there that I thought Run Like the Wind was a, I don't know for sure, but I think it was a tribute by Gordon. There's a long and very proud heritage of Indian runners, as you know. Yes, I hadn't thought of that. I mean, Running Like the Wind is a metaphor that's used all over the globe. So that may have been a tribute. Honestly, I don't know, but I can see why somebody would see it that way. Now the mother was alone and the winter was at hand and she prayed to her spirit kin. 
it was warm in the lodge in the Kentucky Kills. Then a blizzard came up. So there's all sorts of different weather going on here. So it says the winter was at hand. And yet early in the spring, this was two or three lines ago. So I'm wondering, why do you think there's this discrepancy in the seasons? Is that done deliberately or was this poetic license? Where do we get this kind of shifting of the weather? You know, I thought about that a lot the last couple of days when I was prepping for this. I can't say for sure, but my take on it is that when you're in poverty, when you're trying to survive, time or dates or seasons don't mean a lot, except you have to stay alive in the winter. But I don't know, it does seem to be sort of a metaphor for the seasons, I think. That's my take on it. I don't really know. It's a little hard to say why he did this, but it fits. I'm certainly not going to let it get in the way of my enjoyment of it. Absolutely. Um, And he told her the tale of the terrible affair in the government store down in Cherokee Bend. For three long days and three long nights, they wept and they moored, and then she returned to her work and her weaving, and they tried to forget about Cherokee Bend. Now, this is probably a natural response to a death, and I'm wondering, maybe that was part of that tribal group's ritual for death, would be three days and nights of mourning. We see that in other cultures. What do you think? I did look it up. Yes, you're right. It's across the globe. It's very much in Native American history and tradition to have several days of mourning. And of course, if they had been baptized, which was one of the roles of the missionaries, the three days, obviously, in Christian tradition is represent the three days that Jesus was in the tomb. Yes. But three days of mourning is all over the planet. You are absolutely correct. Yeah. And it's different in different cultures. I mean, it would be three days, seven days, 14 days, whatever. This is clearly not rooted in the Christian tradition. It's probably rooted in that tribal group's tradition that happens to be three days, if that was what Gordon was looking for. I don't know how deeply he researched that. Right. In uh, Buddhist and Hindu, it's 49 days. Okay, 49. Wow. It's either 39 or 49, but it's it's one of those. I just talked to someone that buried their grandfather, and it was on the 49th day, I think she told me, that they released his soul in their minds and hearts. Well, when now we fast forward a while, family is running low on food and the mother decides basically to sacrifice herself so that the boy can survive. And her last instructions to him appear to be, find a place to bury your father, which to me implies that the body can be found or if it can't be, at least find some place to give some sort of a visual tribute to your father. And Not long after that in the song, he buries his mother and returns to the government store, although we're not really sure why he does that. Ostensibly, it's to find a place to bury his father. That had been his mother's final instructions to him, and we know that dying wishes are sacred. But why would he go to the government store for this? So what's he doing there? What do you think? I think the so-called Indian agents controlled everything. I don't think they wanted Native Americans to do anything without their permission or consent and overseeing. So I would say he probably had to go back and find out some way to get permission or make it legal or whatever. The time sequence in here jumps around a little bit, and I don't think you can make total sense out of it because he's, like you said in the beginning, he's telling a great story, a very sad story, but a very important story. That's my take, that he had to go back there to figure something out or get permission, I guess. Well, that makes sense that there would be that level of control. The whites would be calling all the shots. He was 10 years tall and a red skin too, so he hadn't much face to save. And this is a term that probably was marginally acceptable when Gord wrote this song. Now it's completely out of style, and even the football team in Washington, D.C. doesn't refer to to themselves anymore like that. They took a long, long time, my friend. Yes, it did. And now they are the commanders. I don't know if I like commanders, but I certainly didn't like redskins. Well, remember the term redskin came from bounties to kill Native Americans in California in the 1840s and 50s. You got a certain amount of money for a child, more money for a female, obviously. It's a disgusting, racist, and horrific term. 
I was shocked that it took so long. The other thing, I'm from Cleveland, and we used to have a baseball team named the Cleveland Indians. They've changed yeah. their name now. But they had this racist logo called Chief Wahoo. You can look it up. It absolutely was repulsive. And one quick thing, obviously, we wouldn't have had a monitor, a symbol of like the New York Jews or the Detroit Negroes or something like that. No. It was a Native American monikers like this came out of the Boy Scouts, if you know the history. Brave, Tenderfoot, Chief, yes. all that stuff. But you're right. The term redskin should be eliminated. It's absolutely horrific. Yeah. And I only bring that up because it's part of what Gordon was writing. The vocabulary in the mid 70s, that would have been marginally acceptable. It's not now, but we're not going to try to duck it because that absolutely. is what, that's what Gordon wrote. And the men sat around and they laughed and they clowned at the talk of a criminal's grave. So that just the idea of a grave for an indigenous person is laughable to these people, which is despicable and it's cruel, but it is in character with the kind of men that we're talking about here. And I think it kind of supports my point that they're laughing about this kid wanting to give his dad a grave who's they don't even think he's human. And so I think that's where that loops back a bit. Well, not only is he not human, but the fact that he's considered a criminal makes it even worse. Right. Um, that he's violated some law. And again, we're not clear on the context of the original offense, but that's probably not as important as where we're going with the story. Then the man from the East didn't smile when he said, you're the son of that Indian scum. This is clearly a government agent, because if you're saying a man from the East, it's got to be talking about Washington. And he spit on the floor of the government store. This is the boy we're talking about. And it served him to no good end. At the close of the day, they had taken him away to the white man's school down at Cherokee Bend. Now, we talked about this a minute ago, but the prototypical school for native kids in this part of history was the Carlisle Indian School, which mm -hmm. was in Pennsylvania, but it was duplicated all over the country. And it was what went on there was you mentioned some of the things. OK, they cut their hair, they changed their clothes, they changed their diet, they changed their religion or tried to. They didn't allow the kids to speak their own language and as if that wasn't enough, and if that wasn't destructive enough, you also had a ton of sexual abuse, you had a ton of physical abuse, and the motto was kill the Indian, save the man. That's mm -hmm. a direct quotation. Well, I don't know how much saving they did, but they certainly did a lot of killing. Yes. And by the way, this is well documented about the schools and the store. And another movie reference or book reference, excuse me, is a great book by Charles Frazier named 13 Moons. He's the guy that wrote the Civil War one, Cold Something, I forget. Cold Check Mountain. It. It's Cold no, Mountain. No, Cold Mountain. Like, yes. Yeah. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. But he wrote this book called 13 Moons, and it's about exactly that. And it's about Cherokee Nation, too. I highly recommend people who are interested in Native American history to read that book. It's, it's a real page turner. Yeah, we'll put the links to all of these books and maybe to the IMDb listing of the movies that we're mentioning. We'll put those in the show notes when I upload this to Acast. We'll be right back to our conversation with Quentin Paul Kuntz about Cherokee Bend. But first, a word from a podcast partner or two. The American West a place where our character as a nation took shape, where dreams came true, where ambitions were shattered, and where legends were born. But above all, a place where ordinary people came looking for a new life and ended up doing extraordinary things. No one tells the story of the Old West better than author Rick Steber, and now there's a podcast dedicated to his stories and poems. It's called Writing the West, and in every 15-minute episode, you'll hear the stuff most history books left out, but that we can't afford to forget. If you want to hear the real stories of real people in the Old West brought to life, this is the podcast for you. Check it out on Spotify. That's writing, W-R-I-T-I-N-G, The West, the stories and poetry of Rick Steber. 
Radio is so much different than it was in the 80s. We had it all. The music, the movies, the DJs, and morning shows. Back to the 80s Radio is a show from the 80s in podcast form. We bring the memories from that awesome decade back. Join Toscano and Chang every Friday as they take you on a ride back in time, sharing their experiences and laughs. Stop on by and discover some of the wacky things this crazy duo comes up with. They talk about it all, the good, the bad, and the ugly of the greatest decade. Don't miss the greatest 80s podcast in the world. Back to the 80s radio. It's been 21 years since the boy disappeared. Where he run to, nobody knows, but they say he fell in with a man named Jim and he rides in the rodeos. And this comes back to something we were talking about a couple of minutes ago. Okay, these Wild West shows that Buffalo Bill Cody used to have, right. where he would bring in Sitting Bull and other people that were so called show Indians that were there absolutely as tokenists they were props in the show there were reenactments of the battle of little bighorn and it was with no idea or no concept of respect to the native americans it was purely i don't want to go so far as to say it was exploitative but it certainly was not out of respect it was for the sake of capitalism and for the sake of entertainment very much so in the mention of the lyrics where he said he rode in the rodeo that was very common. I did some digging on this. Obviously, many Native Americans were expert horseback riders without saddles. And they were featured in these Wild West shows and in rodeos because of they could ride bareback, they could ride standing up, they could do tricks. And again, uh, one more reference is in the movie, excuse me, the documentary, The Way West by Frontline PBS. It's a long one. It's the best documentary I've ever seen on Native American history, told mainly from the Native American point of view. And they were only able to do this because the producers worked very hard on the release of information of the government. Highly recommend it. You can watch it online or, again, through Frontline PBS. It's called The Way West. And it was produced by Rick Burns, Ken's yes. Uh, brother. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. And I think Florentine Films, which is Ken Burns's company, I think was involved with that. So. In addition to it being accurate and being informative, it's also going to be exquisitely well done. The music in it is fantastic. And there's a whole bunch of famous American historians in there, a ton. It's modeled very much if you saw the Civil War one where there's letters and correspondence and stuff. It's done beautifully. It's hard to watch. And they do cover the so-called show Indians in Buffalo Bill at the very end of, of the show. Yeah, correct. And the song ends with the boy visiting a grave. It's interesting that the boy is never actually given a name. Visiting a grave that was previously unmarked, but the boy has marked it with some sort of stone. We don't know whose grave it is, whether it's his mother's grave or his father's grave. We don't know if the stone has anything carved on it, but we know that there now is something that could be seen as a landmark for one of this boy's or maybe both this boy's parents. And it's 21 years after the fact, I guess. So the song was on the Cold on the Shoulder album. That was his 10th original album. It was recorded in 74 and then released in 75. It was produced by Lenny Waronker. It was the 10th song on the record. It was the fourth song on Side B. This is a true album cut. It wasn't released as a single, but it was the B-side of the single that came off of this record, which was Rainy Day People and that I've talked about in another episode. So this is, I think, maybe the first time I've talked about a song that actually was mentioned as a B-side. The album went to 44 in Australia, number three in Canada, and number 10 in the US. I don't believe it charted in the UK. We're talking about the music, my favorite musical aspect of it, and there are a lot of good aspects of this too, but I think Jim Gordon's drumming really drives the song. It reminds me a little bit of the drum beats you might associate with Native American rituals and music, or at least what we hear in public about those. And so there is a driving beat behind the storytelling. Of course, Gordon's voice and the lyrics carry the story, but I say that Jim Gordon is probably the engine under the hood that makes the whole thing go. Yeah, it's really amazing on this album. Twelve different musicians are on this album. Both Red Shea and Terry Clements are on it, and both Rick Haynes and John Stockfish are on it. And by the way, hint, hint, I don't know if you've covered this yet, but on this album, one of my favorite songs, The Soul is the Rock, 
If you haven't covered that, make a note. I can certainly yak about that one, too. (laughs) Okay. All right. Duly noted. No, I haven't talked about that one. We don't know who exactly played on this track, except for Gordon and Jim Gordon. So we don't know exactly who played bass. We don't know exactly who played the lead guitar. We know that Pee Wee Charles was playing steel on it. But the other personnel on this particular track, we don't know and we may never know. Gordon played this song 45 times in concert, almost all of them in the 20th century. The first one was on October 6th, 1974 at Symphony Hall in Boston. I know that he also played all the lovely ladies in that same set, but that's because of my show with Barbara J. And then the last time he played it was in May of 2002 in Akron at the Highland Theater, so across the state from you, I guess. And there's only one cover of this song that I could find, and that was J.P. Cormier. And I'm wondering, have you heard it, the cover of this, and is there anybody that you would like to hear try this, or is this one of those songs that Gordon did it, the mold is broken, nobody should ever touch it again? Good questions. I have heard J.P.'s cover of it. He's also a Canadian singer and songwriter. He's covered a lot of Lightfoot songs. Somewhere on the internet, I saw that Tony Rice covered it, but I couldn't find it listed on any of his albums. Now, who would I like to play this? I want a Native American band to play it. And I don't know if they would, but I have heard a group called Red Earth. They're out of New Mexico. Uh, They're still together. They've had a lot of people in this band. I encourage your audience to check them out. They've got a lot of stuff posted on YouTube, etc. I don't know if they would, but to me, that would seem like it would just be just putting a bow on this thing, even though it's a tough, tough song. And I think it would be honoring Lightfoot tremendously. I hear what you're saying on that. There is only one artist that I would love to hear try this that is still with us, and that would be Fred Small. I don't know if he's still active in music. I heard at some point that he got married and went off and became a Unitarian minister, but he certainly has the conscience for it. Fred is not known for singing other people's words or playing other people's music. He writes mostly his own stuff, but he's the only one that I've thought of. And then maybe Willie Nelson. Those are the only two that I thought maybe I'd like to hear that. I hadn't thought of a Native American doing it, but I think that would be, if they would do it, there would be some real authenticity to that. One big point about the song, real quick, Michael, is that Gordon repeats the chorus a number of times. Yes. That's not usually his style that I can think of. And I believe he repeats the chorus to drive home the point of the horror of the whole thing. And the chorus, if you want to call it that, or he does repeat that portion of it, the idea that he died by a rope down in Cherokee Bend. And then the other thing that he repeats is, Daddy didn't like what the white man said, which is painting the white men in this story in an even worse light. I think that was deliberate. That was not because somebody said, hey, we need to make the song longer. This wasn't just a cosmetic thing that he was doing. So before we get to our exit question, any other closing thoughts on this song? And then we had one other thing we wanted to talk about today. Well, there's a great line in there. It says, he didn't have a friend in Cherokee Bend. The loneliness, the isolation, just the brutality of this time is so brilliantly and honorably written by Gordon. I mean, this is a really rough song. It makes me very emotional, obviously. But I think it's one of his better ones in the sense of, as you pointed out, it tells a great story. And one last thing about it is, I think you've seen them too. There's posters out that say Gordon Lightfoot, American's Troubadour. (laughs) Uh, No. I'll send you one. You know, it is a little interesting that Gordon is writing a song about American, Native Americans, which is interesting. But I think uh, as a side note, I think it adds a confusion because some people think because he plays more of his show or did play more of his shows than ever in America than Canada, that he's from here. And of course, he's from outside Toronto. Exactly. I haven't seen one that says America's Troubadour, but hey, spoiler alert, that's not where he's from. Uh, (laughs) I'll I'll send you the link. There's posters all over the place. Oh, goodness. Okay. All right. (laughs) 
one other thing, this has just occurred to me, and there is one Canadian artist who is still around, although I don't know how active she is, and that would be Buffy St. Marie, who is also, I believe she's from the Cree Nation. I'm not completely positive on that, but I know that that she is Native American. You are correct. Okay. What do you think? If she were still active in the music business, and I don't know if she is, but if she was, what do you think? Do you think this is something that she would take on? Oh, I definitely think so. And by the way, there's a documentary coming out about her. It's going to be released next week. Right. I, and it's I already won some awards. I met Buffy at a festival in northern Michigan about 10 years ago. She is absolutely the coolest person, funny, a great deal of respect for her. And remember, she wrote the song Universal Soldier, not Donovan. She wrote it. Absolutely. That is correct. And I think she did a better job of it than Donovan did, although Donovan did, you know, a very respectable cover of it. Yeah. And he had the hit. And he did have the hit. And so she got the money. I guess everybody wins. Okay, Q, this is something that you and I had talked about before we went on the air today. Where were you? What were you doing when you found out that Gordon had passed? And what did you do or have you done to commemorate his memory? Well, I was at home and I received a call from his office about 10 o'clock that night. And um, boy, it was rough. I have a little uh, a tribute to Gordon in my house, photographs over the years. I had a birthday this summer and I displayed all the photographs. Well, I've got tons from concerts and meeting with him. And I put up some things. I downloaded some photos. And for about a month, I lit a candle by a photo of him and me from many years ago. and. You know, Michael, now we're in what we call legacy territory, or as it said, he belongs to the ages. Yeah, they said that about Lincoln, but it's right. equally true for Gord. And my Lord, he was a poet, a wordsmith, a craftsman, an arranger, the leader of the band, master of six and 12 string guitars, that golden voice, beloved by millions, imitated, but never duplicated. There will never be another Gordon Lightfoot. I don't care how many years pass. I don't know what kind of influence we will have, but there will never be anyone who is just so quintessentially a beautiful musician. I heard from several people that they said Bob Dylan wept when he heard the news. It wouldn't surprise me a bit. I mean, Dylan's very cagey about his own emotions. And I don't even know if he put out a public statement, but it would not surprise me a bit that Dylan did that. And I think that he recognized that Gordon was everything that Bob was with a lot more romanticism. I'm not going to go into huge comparisons of the two because that's not a productive discussion topic, but I truly think that Of all the people who came along in Dylan's wake, there is no one who can compare to Gordon. I agree so strongly. And one note that your listeners probably have heard, maybe not. A few years ago, Justin Trudeau called Gordon Lightfoot and offered him a state funeral when the time came. And Gordon's response was, that's not me. The service was held in the church where he was baptized and sang in the choir. Correct. And this is tough to hear, but when people were lined up for the service, um, it started to rain. And spontaneously, people broke into singing Rainy Day People. Oh. Does that pull on your heartstrings? It does. I mean, I was going to say that maybe they started singing Early Morning Rain, which would have also been good. I came very close to buying a ticket and flying out there for the service, and I just couldn't raise the funds to get from San Francisco to Toronto, but I still intend to go visit there and go down the Lightfoot Trail, and it's going to be a little bit more bittersweet. Where can people find you online and in real life, Quentin? Well, in real life, I live outside of Cleveland, Ohio, and you can find me on the internet The best place to finally find me is on Facebook, and I'm on the Gordon Lightfoot fan page that Deb Rowan has put together. But I would love for people to reach out. I'm always up for a discussion about this man who I am very grateful that I met. It's tough to think that he's not with us, but, you know, 
the ancient Greeks and many people believe the definition of eternity is that we live on in memory. And boy, I will never forget this man, his generosity, his talent. And I told people on my birthday this summer, yeah, it was cool hanging out with him. And I've already told the story how we met him and everything. And yeah, he was famous and obviously successful, but he was my friend. He gave me great advice when I went through a nasty divorce eight years ago. He was my friend and I miss my friend. My friend is gone. And he was a really cool guy, humble, funny. And he could have gone the other way. I knew him back in the party days. And yeah, he had some issues back then. But with the aneurysm in 2002, he found out that fans loved him. And ever since that time, we got 20 years with him that we probably might never have had. So I tend to look on the positive side. And as soon as we get done here, I'm going to be playing some Gordon Lightfoot. (laughs) There you go. Well, Quentin, this is such a joy. I've really been looking forward to talking to you again because we haven't had a chance since Gordon passed. So thank you for taking the time today. And you know that I'm going to want you to be back on the show soon. Take care, my friend. And hello to everybody out there. And um, let's just uh, remember him with all our love and, and also our gratitude. We have a lot to be thankful that we all have followed his music. and as we follow the golden sun. And thanks for listening, everybody. If you like this well enough to listen to the whole thing, tell somebody about it. Carefree Highway Revisited is on Apple, Spotify, Acast, or wherever you get your listening matter. Our website is www.lightfootpodcast.com. I'd like to make a special request for you to visit my Patreon page. I love this show so much, and I want to keep it going. And you're in a position to help please head over to www.patreon.com slash carefree highway revisited a dollar or two a month is all i ask you can reach me mike messner at teacher mike 72 at gmail.com well our next episode is going to feature my guest ed lewick he will be making his second appearance on the podcast and he and i will be discussing summer side of life from the 1971 album of the same name That episode will be coming out in early November 2023. Until then, for Quentin Paul Kuntz, this is Mike Messner reminding you, run for the roses, but don't forget to stop and smell them. We'll see you next time.